Can people hear me in the back? OK, great. I'm going to talk about dynamics in the outskirts of galaxies. And most of the focus, probably all of the focus here, will be about galaxies in the Virgo cluster. I'll show you some results from the next generation Virgo cluster survey. My main collaborators on this project are Elisa Toloba, a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz. Eric Peng at the Calvary Institute in Beijing, um, former graduate student of his, Biao Li. Um, the folks in italics, Stephanie Chen, Jason Chu, Rachel Guo, Leah Sparkman, Samyukta Yagati, they are all, uh, they all did their work when they were high school students. They did their work uh, at Santa Cruz in the context of this project. And Pat Cote, Laura Ferreresi at Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics in Victoria are our collaborators on the NGVS. They lead the NGVS collaboration. So the original motivation, collecting these, uh, the data that I'll talk about, was to study globular cluster satellites of dwarf elliptical galaxies in the Virgo cluster, specifically to stack this sample of satellites. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by stacking in just a minute. We targeted dwarf ellipticals in the Virgo cluster that are, uh, have low enough luminosity that each one is expected to contain only a handful of globular cluster satellites. Now, there's, naturally, there's a well-defined relationship between the number of globular clusters a galaxy contains and its luminosity. And these galaxies have low enough luminosity that you don't expect them to contain too many satellites, globular cluster satellites. We selected these satellites using uh, the NGVS, so Next Generation Virgo Cluster Survey. And uh, we followed them up using the Keck Telescope at DEMOS spectrograph. Um, we went after likely globular cluster candidates, but we also had room on the DEMOS mass to target things that we realized were not likely to be globular cluster candidates. And in fact, I'll start with things that turned out not to be globular clusters. Uh, that's, that's what I'll really focus on in this talk. So before I talk about the things that are not globular cluster satellites, let me say a little bit about our observations. These were, there's been a, uh, in all the Keck runs I've had last 20 years, 21 years, these three half nights have turned out to be more productive than anything I've ever done three half nights on Keck and Deimos. We, um, I'd like to think part of that is because of how carefully we planned this survey, but some of it is just chance. So we used the 600 line grating. We uh, covered a pretty wide wavelength range from H beta through the calcium triplet. These are what would be considered medium resolution spectra, R of about 2000. Um, we had nine slit masks targeting um, one and a half to two hours per mass, targeting 21 dwarf elliptical galaxies. So you can see that uh, our masks had two or three DEs on them, each mask, two or three DEs on them. They were chosen so that they could fit two or three dwarf ellipticals per mask. There were about 300 globular cluster candidates on these masks, going quite faint, down to G magnitude of 24 and a half. Some of them selected from uh, Hubble Space Telescope Survey, ACS Virgo Cluster Survey. And the advantage of selecting using Hubble is the globular clusters are slightly resolved. So you can be sure you're not taking foreground stars uh, by accident. Um, on the other hand, the majority of our uh, survey, the majority of the survey area is not covered by Hubble. So we relied on ground-based next generation Virgo survey. And that next generation Virgo survey is a 100 square degree imaging survey with the Canada France Hawaii telescope, MegaCam. Uh, it's in four filters, U, G, I, and Z. Um, there are probably people in the room who are part of the NGVS collaboration, large collaboration. And from the ground based data, it's not so easy to tell if something is a foreground star versus a globular cluster at the distance of Virgo. There's a very interesting sort of um, 
set of coincidences, a typical globular cluster in the Milky Way halo, uh, sorry, a typical, a typical star, main sequence star in the Milky Way halo is about a thousand times closer than Virgo, but there are about a million stars in globular clusters, so they look like the apparent brightness of a globular cluster is about the same as, as an individual star in the halo of the Milky Way. Um, we'll come to colors in a minute and we'll come to uh, other aspects that can help distinguish between these two populations. But we deliberately put uh, foreground stars on our mass because we had room on the slit mass. We have a few hundred filler targets, main sequence turn off stars in the halo of the Milky Way. Okay, so here's a, an example of a section of the NGVS survey where um, you can barely see two low surface brightness galaxies. Let me see if I can, I don't know, if, does this laser pointer work? Sorry. Oh, thanks, thanks. Okay. So there's one dwarf elliptical here, another one up there, and the orange circles are globular cluster candidates selected on the basis of color and magnitude. Here's another example. This one has four DEs on them. This one, this one, this one right here, and this one. And you can see we've selected a bunch of globular cluster candidates from around them. If I zoom into one of them with Hubble, this is an ACS Virgo cluster survey image of one of the DEs in Virgo. And the globular cluster candidates are circled. Um, if you could zoom in, if you had enough resolution, they might look like this. We don't, of course, have that kind of resolution. <laughs> um, so here, here are the globular clusters in color magnitude space. So I want to emphasize that we're going quite faint with our spectroscopy. It's not like we always succeed in measuring velocities of these faint magnitudes. But the objects in red and orange are globular cluster candidates. And you can sort of see a, a plume running up the middle here. These are turnoff stars. In fact, this hockey stick shaped feature is the main sequence and main sequence turn off of the Sagittarius stream. Sagittarius is everywhere, including in the direction uh, of the Virgo cluster. So primary science targets, these are fillers, and our radial velocity success rate starts to drop off, at least for absorption line targets, down at, down at about that uh, level. OK, so we, I don't expect you to read everything on this slide, but we, the way we identify globular cluster satellites is we first start with things that have the right colors to be globular clusters. We then um, look at the ones we can measure radial velocities for, and we finally we plot every globular cluster in, in relation to its potential host in terms of its radial velocity separation from a galaxy in Virgo and its projected distance from that same galaxy. So R over R effective on one axis, delta V on the other axis. And what we concluded were um, that, yes, we found a bunch of satellites, and I'll show you evidence for that in a minute. But we concluded that there are a bunch of objects there that have the colors to be globular clusters. They have, but they're not associated with any obvious galaxy in Virgo. We don't think these are foreground stars because their velocities are too extreme. Their velocities are, uh, we see a population of Milky Way stars. Their velocities are centered at about zero heliocentric velocity. So in the heliocentric velocity range plus minus 300 kilometers per second, there's a lot of Milky Way stars. We can see them in our survey. But there's a bunch of objects well outside that velocity range that are not obviously associated with any, um, uh, any of these dwarf ellipticals in, in Virgo. So these, these so-called orphan globular clusters are all found in our nine masks. Our nine masks are shown here. That's M87. The background grayscale is just an alpha minus one, alpha to the minus one power law distribution. So here's a real image from NGVS with some of our masks. And um, so again, we're using imaging and spectroscopic data. But here is a color color diagram that shows off what these globular clusters look like. So let me spend just a, a moment on this, um, 
uh, on this graph right here. Uh, you'll see objects, three kinds of objects here, three, three colors shown here. There are orange triangles here that form, that are the most diffuse of the three distributions shown here. The orange triangles are background galaxies. We found them by chance because they, we, we thought they were foreground stars or globular clusters in Virgo. Instead, they turned out to have emission lines and they are clearly in the background of Virgo. You can see that they are they're quite diffuse in this diagram because they have a wide range of stellar mixes, wide range of stellar populations. Young stars, old stars, metal rich, metal poor stars um, are populate this. So in a U minus GG minus I diagram, they're quite diffuse. By contrast, the green objects are objects with absorption line velocities, not emission line velocities, absorption line velocities, but with velocities in the range plus minus 300 kilometers per second around zero. So relatively low um, heliocentric radial velocities. These things we believe are halo stars in the Milky Way, metal poor old stars in the Milky Way, and understandably they form a fairly tight sequence, and that's this green sequence you see here running this way. These are turn-off stars, and these are very late type these are lower main sequence stars. So you can see there's a range of stars. And by the way, if you do the same experiment at bright magnitudes, the sequence is, is quite tight. Our sequence is relatively fuzzy because these are faint objects. And even with the depth of the NGVS, the photometry is, uh, the photometric scatter is what we're seeing. Now, the objects that lie, that have absorption line velocities, but that lie close to Virgo cluster dwarf ellipticals, the, the satellite globular clusters. These things are certainly globular clusters because they are very close in position on the sky and velocity to a dwarf elliptical galaxy in Virgo. Those things are marked in red here. And you can see they form an even tighter knot. And their location is worth talking about for a moment. These things don't have as wide a range of colors as the stars, because these globular clusters are made up of old metal poor stars, but they're an average of this green sequence. Um, so it's understandable that they lie, uh, that they occupy a tight range. Moreover, it's because this green sequence is curved like this, if you take an average of points drawn from that locus, you're going to get a point that's off that locus. If the locus were a straight line in this diagram, the average of points on that locus would lie on the line itself. Here, the red points lie slightly above the line. So when we, when we now look at globular clusters that turn out not to be associated with dwarf ellipticals in Virgo, that's what their distribution looks like. They're now marked in blue. The stars and galaxies have stayed the same. I'm marking these orphan globular clusters, for lack of a better word. And you know, I'll just go back and forth. They look very much like the satellites in color-color space. Their only fault, the orphans, their only fault is they don't have a parent. They don't have an obvious parent. They don't have an obvious galaxy that's in proximity to them in position and velocity. So we draw a line through them, and we try to separate out the stars from orphan globular clusters. Because so far, we've only been using velocity, position on the sky. Now let's use this color-color diagram. And as expected, if you look at the if you look at only objects within that shaded band, this is now the, the distance of each object from that line we drew. And you can see that the satellites and often globular clusters are centered around 0, 0 at the distribution by, by construction, because the line was drawn through those, the locus of globular clusters. But the stars are naturally offset to the left. They are below the line, by and large. So we're using information like this to try and clean up our samples, try and separate the foreground stars from these orphan globular clusters. We are also going to use uh, some image information. It turns out even from the NGVS, you can tell, most, for most globular clusters, you can tell that they're slightly fuzzier than the point spread function. So that information hasn't yet been incorporated. But once we do, we hope to separate out the orphan globular clusters even better from, than, than we can currently do. 
But here's one of the results. If you take the orphan globular clusters and you plot their cumulative radial distribution as a function of projected distance from M87, you get a graph like this. The orphan globular clusters are marked in light blue. The stars and galaxies are marked in green and orange. And you can see the orphan globular clusters are much more centrally concentrated towards M87. Uh, we have a big gap in radial coverage. That's what that horizontal line is. Just our distribution of our mass is such that there's a range of radii of which we don't have any data. If you take a uniform distribution, that's this uh, pink line. So the stars and galaxies sort of look like a uniform distribution. The orphans look like an alpha equals minus one power law. Again, roughly. We need to clean up these samples a little bit. The other thing is if you look in velocity space, these objects with no parents have, no obvious parents, have um, a velocity distribution that's symmetric about M87. And I just want to take a moment to point out the x-axis. One degree is nearly 300 kiloparsecs at the distance of Virgo. M87's effective radius is 8 kiloparsecs. Okay, so these things are going out to several tens of effective radii for M87. Their velocity distribution and their spatial distribution suggest that they are symmetric around M87. And I do want to say that this band is something that's been artificially excluded from the survey so far because anything in that band is being called a star right now and we want to improve our star globular cluster separation a little more. Um, this is going out to the, the edge of the, the right edge of this axis is going out to about a third of the virial radius of the Virgo cluster. So the fact that we're seeing these globular clusters so far away is um, sort of exciting. Now, I want to change gears completely and move much closer into these dwarf ellipticals and show you some results from a paper that Elisa Toloba recently published. This is now looking at the dwarf elliptical galaxy hosts where these globular cluster satellites were around, but looking at their kinematics from long slit spectroscopy. And I show you two examples of what you might think of as a rotation curve. You put a long slit across and you measure the radial velocity as a function of position along the slit on the approaching side of the galaxy, on the receding side of the galaxy, and you get um, what looks like a rotation curve. The approaching and receding halves are marked with different symbols. So you expect a rotating galaxy to have symmetric or symmetric rotation curve, but there are some examples of gross asymmetry. That is, if you fold the rotation curve about the few the rotation curve about the nucleus of the galaxy. One side of the galaxy has a different velocity profile, velocity versus radius, than the other side. Okay, so many of them are symmetric, like that one, that one. Some of the arabas are big in the outer parts, that one, symmetric. But this is a great example of one side looks like it's rotating, the other side has just fallen down and is not doing anything at all. If you look at the light blue points compared to the dark blue points. So I have no idea what these mean. Absolutely, you want to say that at the outset, but they're uh, out there. It may have something to do with the transformation of, of galaxies that produce DEs, but I would say about 25 to 30% of galaxies show some kind of anomaly like this, kinematic, um, kin kinematical anomaly. Okay. I'm not going to say a lot about the stacking of globular cluster satellites, but here are the satellites. I talked a lot about the orphans. Here are the satellites. There are about... The 80 some satellites that we've identified, and now we are modeling their dynamics to understand um, what kind of dark matter halos a, a, a typical DE lives in, because it's based on the stack samples. So all we can say is something about the DE population as a whole. And um, I'll just put up my conclusions here to say we've got a bunch of these orphan globular clusters. We think their parents have been eaten alive by M87. And they've now been adopted by M87, so they're not truly orphans, but they're, they're living in this home. They're living far away from, um, from the center of their parent. Um, the origin of the outer kinematic anomalies of DEs remains an interesting mystery. This, these have been out in the literature for a very long time. All that 
but people haven't bothered to fold their rotation curves. If you fold the rotation curve, you can see them in published data. And um, finally, DEs appear to be associated with extended but relatively low mass dark matter halos. And this is very much, all of this is work in progress. So I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. people had measured the specific frequency of globular clusters around dwarf ellipticals. And they found them to be very high, like five, which is like five times as high as what you find around dwarf irregulars. And that has always, at least for me, been a very important argument against the idea that dwarf ellipticals were dwarf irregulars that somehow got their gas stripped off. Mm -hmm. What is your newest constraint on the specific frequency of dwarf ellipticals? Do you find similar high values? Um, I assume everyone could hear the question. I won't repeat it. Um, I don't think I'm in a position to comment directly about the specific frequency of our sample, uh, just because our spectroscopic sample has so many selection biases. One would have to go back to the photometric data um, to really um, look at this. Now, um, I should just say that the photometric data go down to about the peak of the globular cluster uh, luminosity function. Um, so we're seeing about half, you know, to the extent that the globular cluster luminosity function is a roughly symmetric function. Uh, we can directly count about half the globular clusters in these DEs. Um, there are papers that people are working on in NGVS that are based just on the imaging survey that will comment on this. I just don't have a simple answer for you right now. But I agree this is a problem with their origin. Hi. Here. Yep, right. Oh, yeah, there you are. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any estimated number density on the total number of orphan globular clusters in Virgo? Um, again, our selection function starts to get in the way a little bit. Um, we can talk about the shape of that distribution, but you're talking about the normalization of that function. Yeah. Um, we'll have to, this is hot off the press, so I don't yet have um, a number for the normalization. I, I can say with a fair degree of confidence that somewhere between alpha equals minus one and minus two seems to fit our population well, but that doesn't answer your question of how many. Um, so, you know, we've surveyed a very small area of the Virgo cluster. We have about of the order of 80, or no, is it 60 globular clusters, Elisa? Is that the right number? It's a tiny fraction of the area. You saw how small those rectangles were relative to uh, the, uh, you know, the, the radial range they cover. So I suspect there are hundreds of globular clusters, often globular clusters around M87. Um, and we've, you know, thousands is, is, is more likely. Yes, Elisa, Elisa may have a... How does that compare to coma, do you know, for uh, the estimated coma number? Coma has less. Coma has less? Yes. So right now, Virgo has the largest. Uh, is this in terms of observed or estimated? Of observed. Observed, okay. At the same magnitude. And this is in comparison also with other other clusters, et cetera. Okay, one last question over by Mark, and then you can connect your laptop. So, cluster light and the reason this is I think this might be interesting is that a globular, a globular cluster is basically a star from the dynamical standpoint it's so much denser than anything it's likely to encounter so it should move like a point and so I imagine that if the destruction so if the mechanism that frees these globular clusters from their host galaxy is you know say that it gets shocked as it falls through the central galaxy then that should release stars and globular clusters equally, whereas if it's tidal stripping or something like that, the globular clusters, if they were a lot further out, maybe get stripped preferentially. Mm -hmm. So you could maybe learn something from comparing the distribution of globular clusters to the distribution of intracluster light. Have you thought at all about that? We've certainly thought about it, and I think um, 
Uh, Lisa can correct me, but uh, there are people studying the intercluster light in Virgo as well. Chris Mijos is part of the collaboration. He's one of the people interested in this. Um, certainly comparing the surface brightness of the light, the, just the absolute value of that, and its run with radius, been an interesting thing to compare. Um, not yet, no.